first part is just to give you some background on Viagogo. Um, some people, if you did, might know a little bit about the company um, or may have been here last year, so some of it may be a little bit uh, redundant to you, but want to paint the context and the picture for people so they, they understand what the company's about, what we've done. Then launch into uh, the topic du jour, which is understanding customer needs and really talking about some um, tips and some thoughts on what that actually means to an entrepreneur um, and what are some th key things to consider. And then as, um, you know, last year, want to leave plenty of time for Q&A because want to try and make the most of it for all of you and answer, you know, any questions that anybody has. Um, before launching in a bit to Viagogo's background, just give you guys some context for who I am and what I've done, and other than the fact that, that I am uh, from the States, so I speak American, so hopefully it's close enough to English to, for everyone to understand. Um, I, had, uh, I, I graduated from Harvard University. I spent two years as a consultant at a firm called McKinsey in New York, so I can draw charts and sort of state the obvious and charge you a lot of money. Um, <laughs> And then after doing that for two years, I worked at a firm called Bain Capital, which is a buyout firm, a private equity firm. There's a guy, uh, Mitt Romney, who tried to run for president unsuccessfully, who ran the firm as 50 people at the time and would buy and sell companies. And I learned a ton there. And, and those folks have been kind enough to back me in my first business, StubHub, and to back what I'm doing at Viagogo, which I'll explain. Um, I had, in the States, after going to Stanford Business School after Bain Capital, had started StubHub, which was my first business in the States, to let people trade tickets. Um, that company worked out quite well. It was bought by eBay in 2007 for about $310 million. And this year, that company, the gross ticket sales over StubHub, it's only in the US, will probably be about $1.1 billion, um, which with the current exchange rates is actually a meaningful number. Um, so. <laughs> Just to uh, first, so getting to Viagogo though, as, as I say, I came over to start Viagogo. So basically, what are we? Well, our industry is what we call secondary ticketing. Um, and we're a broad ticketing company, but this is really the, the cornerstone is, is resale. This means it's the resale of live event tickets after they've been sold at the box office. So someone's bought tickets to go see Madonna. They can't make it. They need to resell it. Um, and this is what they do. They find a buyer who will, who will buy the ticket. Uh, this is a pretty large market across. Uh, we, I denominate everything in dollars because that's how we raised our capital. And of course, we work in multiple currencies, euros, pounds, and dollars. Across Western Europe, we think it's about $9 billion plus annually in terms of the value of the tickets that trade. And in the United States, $12 billion plus. So it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar market in ticket resale. Um, this has traditionally been dominated by what we call in the state scalpers, what you call touts over here. So basically, you'd go and you'd deal with people on a street corner or at you know, Starbucks or whatnot to buy and sell tickets. Um, and again, in the US, all of this to revolutionize ticket resale. My company, StubHub, did a lot of that, which was letting people go direct. And I'll explain more. So what is Viagogo? So obviously, we looked and said, well, Viagogo is an online ticket exchange that allows people to buy and sell tickets in a safe, guaranteed way. Um, when we say safe and guaranteed, what do we mean? We mean that the person who is buying the ticket will get the ticket they ordered, will get it on time, um, and will get it, uh, will be an uh, actual ticket. It won't be fraudulent. The person who sold the ticket will get paid, so they don't have to worry about not getting paid. Um, and you know, the key is that, unlike eBay, which I'll explain, we take care of the payment and delivery and guarantee that. Um, in return, our business model is that we charge a total of 25% worth of fees. Um, it's actually now 15% to the buyer, 10% to the seller. So if I sell two tickets for 100 pounds uh, to, uh, you know, to Theo, Theo will pay 100 pounds for the two tickets, plus he'll pay 15 pounds for the uh, buyer fee. Uh, I, as the seller, will receive uh, 90 pounds, which is 100 less the 10 pound seller fee. Um, so basically, there's 25 pounds worth of fees for Viagogo in that transaction. Um, it's no inventory negative working capital. So by that, I mean we don't take inventory of any tickets. So we're not holding warehouses of tickets. And negative working capital or float means we get paid now, and then we pay people down the line. So we're actually making float, which is interest on the money. Um, we launched in the UK and Germany in August of 2006. And we then. Um, uh, launched in the U.S. in August of 2007. We do sort of some different things in the U.S. because StubHub's, you know, got, got the majority of that niche. And then we launched in the rest of Europe in the fourth quarter of 2007 with some local sites. 
Um, our backers, again, I realize predominantly I'm, I'm an American coming over to Europe. Um, it always behooves you to have backers who are local, who know the lay of the land. So tried to get folks, um, many of whom you may know. Our one VC backer is a firm called Index, a gentleman named Danny Reimer is on our board. Um, Danny's uh, many claims to fame, very successful guy, things like Skype, Last.fm, Betfair, MySQL. Brent Hoberman, who started LastMinute.com, is an investor, Nicholas Instrom from Skype. Um, Jacob Rothschild is a financier. And then also from the world of sport, Ian Todd, who runs international for IMG. And then folks in, in various categories geographically, Herbert Kloiber, big media guy in Germany. Bernard Arnault, big financier in France. Gordy Crawford, big media investor in the States. So competitive landscape, just a, a quick overview. And actually, um, Ticketmasters tried to, to get into the secondary market. They bought a, a small company called Get Me In and tried to do it. But traditionally, you've got three sort of buckets. Um, one is you have the primary ticketing companies. So you have ticket companies that effectively will um, sell the original ticket and do this. And they're having a lot of pressure on their business model. But they've got certain issues to get into what we call the aftermarket. Uh, one is conflict of interest to be in both. So in other words, if you're the channel where you're supposed to be selling people the original tickets from the box office, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, gee, would you like the original ticket or we have the resold ticket and we'll divert people? It creates a huge conflict in terms of what the artist and the channel wants to do. And this is a problem and it's something they ran into in the US. Um, in general, it's what we call a dying business model becoming commoditized. So let me explain what I mean by that. Primary ticketing before Ticketmaster, which was a general monopoly in the States, and Venom is sort of the Ticketmaster of Germany and other people, for years we're, we're offering two key things, technology and distribution. Technology were the card readers, access controls, ticket printing. That's all become a commodity. It's commodity hardware. The distribution was for people certainly uh, as old as myself, uh, remember going to Tower Records or HMV to buy tickets. Uh, that's not what people do anymore. You buy over the internet. So there are entire barriers to entry, much like the old phone companies where they had all the cable into your home and could charge you 10 pounds a minute, have now gone away and actually become an albatross for them. And so that's a real problem. Um, for them, and so they're finding pressure even in their core business model. And they also have a limited skill set. So again, these are people who are used to running pipes uh, you know, into the box office and just selling things en masse. And when you get into the issues of, of consumer to consumer trades and the pricing and the, and the maintenance and stuff, it's not really what they do. Online auction companies, eBay, obviously eBay went ahead and bought StubHub in the States. eBay is a great company. Um, but it doesn't work well for time-sensitive items. The reason they had to buy StubHub is that if I buy a non-time-sensitive item on eBay, like an antique table, if it's chipped or the wrong color, I can give you negative feedback, get my money out of escrow, and then go buy another table next week. Not ideal, but it's a solvable problem. If I want to see Madonna one night only at Wembley, or say, see Man U play Chelsea on Saturday, I have to get that ticket on time. If I don't, I'm out of luck and I'm out of patience. And it's not really going to matter whether I'm giving people negative feedback. And eBay runs hundreds of categories. There, it works great for tons of things, but not for time-sensitive items. And then in the US, of course, we've got secondary ticketing companies, StubHub, which is the largest, my former company. Um, they really are just in the US, and there's a lot of issues to build a business in Europe locally that we think are challenging. So it's just to give you a sense of the landscape. Partnerships, um, just to, because this will get to sort of, you know, we, uh, of course, our end customer is the consumer, and we'll talk about that in the fan, but we do work through a number of different partners. And so sports teams, uh, we're the official exclusive partner for people like Man U and Chelsea, uh, Bayern Munich, a number of other partners. And so this allows their folks to resell tickets in a safe, secure way, it allows us to market officially as the partner with these people. In music, we've worked with a number of people, most prominently Madonna. We were the official secondary and premium ticketing provider for her European tour. It's the first time ever that an artist, uh, much less the largest uh, selling artist, female artist of all time, had endorsed a secondary ticketing company officially. Uh, media partners, lastminute.com, The Independent, even some applications on Facebook to let people trade tickets. Um, we work with charities where we basically will allow them to make money through auctioning tickets and so forth, and they can market to their database. And then we have corporations ranging from Goldman Sachs to UBS, who, who thankfully are two investment banks that are still in business, um, that uh, if they have any money left, uh, want to buy tickets and entertain, entertain clients. So OK, so with that, just sort of give you the background, really want to have a discussion about some, uh, some points on customer needs and, and talk broadly about this, and then you know, answer your questions. So um, you know, as, as Shai said, you know, with no customer, no business, 
I mean, this sounds somewhat obvious. I mean, it, it seems sort of cliche, but be shocked. I mean, again, I, I ran the, um, was the head of the entrepreneurship club at Stanford and looking at ideas there. And when you'd see many people doing things and have seen things over the years, there, there's a lot of people who have ideas that they think are interesting and they have no customer sort of problem. Um, so, you know, you never know. So I think a couple different things I wanted to touch on. Um, the first one is this concept of idea generation and sort of thinking about customer needs. So, you know, it's, we're all customers. So basically, you know, every day you're dealing with things where you're consuming things, you're paying for things, uh, you are patrons of businesses, and there are issues and problems that you run into, um, and those are opportunities, potentially, for you to think through. Um, and I'll give you the example of StubHub, um, you know, and how I ended up getting into that business quite seriously. Um, a couple things. One is that, you know, for years I'd been, um, you know, using ticket brokers, and my parents had had season seats for, for sports teams, and you'd always go and do this. Things really in the spring of 1999, I was working in Boston at Bain Capital, and my girlfriend at the time wanted to go see The Lion King, which was a recently opened show in, in New York, and had to pay through the nose for tickets. Very unpleasant experience, had to find a broker, pay tons of money for these tickets. And that got me thinking, gee, there should be a better way to do this. Why isn't there? And I you know, went and looked at reasons why eBay and Ticketmaster couldn't do it. And that really started that process going for how I got into the business, myself having been a customer of this. The thing which really cemented it as I was doing my research as a customer is that I actually had season tickets for the Lakers, which is the big basketball team in, in LA, um, and a very popular team, big fan of. And the Lakers that year had made the finals of the NBA. It's best of seven games. You know, that's like the Champions League, but you know, multiple games, big deal. So I had my college reunion, my five-year college reunion. So I'm a big fan, but I'm not going to miss my reunion. So I figure I'll sell the tickets and make some money. So this is before StubHub had, had started, and we were just sort of investigating it. So I figured, OK, well, I'm going to be clever about this. And I'm going to call a couple brokers first. And I'm going to act as if I am looking to buy tickets. So I call about three brokers, and I say, I'm looking to buy tickets. You know, how much in this range where my seats are? Pretty consistently, look like $2,000. So I'm thinking, this is great. Make some money. Maybe I should miss every game in the series. Um, <laughs> and so this is wonderful. So I call back about half an hour later. Call the guy up. I say, all right, I'm selling. I'm selling Lakers tickets. Said, I said, how much you give me? Guy says, how much you want? I said, how much you give me? How much you want? This went on for about five minutes. Until finally, I finally said to the guy, I said, well, tell you what, I want $1,500. Because, you know, they got to make their margin, and I figured he'd said $2,000, $1,500. Guy says to me on the phone, he says, $1,500? You're a crook. That's crazy. He says, that's more than I'm selling them for. And I said, was more than you were selling them for 10 minutes ago? And the guy says, well, hold on. And he puts me on hold, comes back two minutes later, and he says, tell you what, we'll give you $1,000 a ticket, offer's good for five minutes, and I don't like how you do business checking prices. So. <laughs> said, my God, if I can't beat that on customer service, then we really have a problem at, at, uh, at Viagogo and at StubHub. So again, that's an example of I myself was a customer in this particular industry, had gone through a process, and had sort of seen there's an issue here. This doesn't work. And there's technology, namely the internet um, at that time, which was taking off and we take for granted, that should solve it. So the first thing is really start with your own experiences, because if you've already done it and you're a customer, it's a little bit easier than sometimes academically if you're looking at a book from the outside looking in and thinking, well, this is really logical or rational or, you know, this is what I think on a, on a whiteboard. If you've actually experienced it, you know how the process works, it's a great way to generate ideas by being a customer yourself. And, and you should always think of yourself as a customer. So that leads to the, the second issue. Um, as we say, solve a problem, don't find a solution in search of a problem, okay? Um, now this is again from, I'm, I'm not a, my background's not technical, so I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not an engineer, I'm lucky I can operate a computer and a microphone and, and all that stuff, and thankfully I've got uh, real smart people who do the real work at the company who can, who can do that. Um, but being at Stanford, when I was at Stanford, there was always, you know, I was at a business school and there's the engineering school, and they're, you know, of course, what the business people suffer from is that none of us have any skills um, and, uh, and can't really do anything. Um, but, but the flip side, seriously, is you've got the people at the engineering school who, who tinker with something, come up with something they think is fascinating, 
and it's brilliant technology, and then they go and search for a problem that it can solve. So they don't have an application, it's just, this is amazing. I mean, you know, and, and, but, but well, what's the problem you're solving? What are you doing with it? Well, you know, it, it's, it's so smart it should have a problem. I don't know. The only, uh, the, the only problem is finding someone who needs it. Um, so I think, you know, and it, it's not really just about the technology. It's really you need to find, you need to think through what's the problem that we want to solve and then solve the problem. And again, it goes back to one way if you're the customer, um, you know, you've got an issue where uh, you can really learn these things and do these things. And again, I think as part of that, when you say, you know, you want to solve a problem, you want to solve a problem where it's really a problem for people. It's not simply this would be nice to have, this would be good to have, but it's a real problem. So again, taking the ticket example, people are buying and selling tickets. We're not trying to convince people to buy and sell tickets. It's a behavior that they have anyway, okay, as an end user. The, having something which is not safe, secure, guaranteed, getting fraudulent tickets, getting ripped off, not having transparency, this is a clear win. You're solving problems in the market for that consumer. It's very clear why they're going to prefer to buy on Viagogo in the safety and security of their home, um, guaranteed, rather than going down to you know, the corner shop and you know, wearing a red hat and saying the eagle has landed and praying they don't meet uh, Jack the Ripper. Um, so it's, it's a, um, again, it's really important. And I think you really need to always make sure you're not just doing an intellectual exercise, but that you're solving a problem. And, and I would add to that, it is a problem which not just you think is a problem, but the customer thinks is a problem. So this is, this is the other thing, too, related to that. Um, you are ultimately selling to your customer once you identify what the cus who the customer is. The customer has to feel that they um, want this service, like this service, and it is a better solution for them. Okay, that's, that's effectively sales. This, again, seems obvious, but it takes a while to sort of understand this till you're out there because you know, obviously, you know, let's say you're very smart, well-educated people, and you say, obviously, any rational person would prefer my solution. Well, all that matters is not what you prefer. It doesn't even matter what a rational person prefers. It matters what your customer prefers. So your customer has to want that solution and want to go through that process to get it. And you can't lose sight of that um, because, believe me, at first, uh, when I was starting out, you'd go to sales meetings and, you know, you'd want to reach across the table and say, are you an idiot? You know, of course you should be doing this. That's not terribly persuasive. At least it didn't work for me. Um, so, you know, again, you want to be thinking from the point of view of who your customer is and what they think their problem is. Third is the idea of a business model, not just a product feature. So let's say you've, you've thought through something, you've seen a problem, and now you've got a solution to a problem. Okay, so that's, that's the first two steps. Identify a problem, find a solution. Third trap. Very straightforward, but do you have a business model as opposed to just a product feature or something without a business model? And this can get very, um, uh, very cloudy for people at times because they'll say, for, there used to be, and this was true during the internet bubble, um, and I think we'll see a lot with what's happening in the economy where companies that don't have a business model, you know, if you're not solving a problem, you're probably really in trouble. If you're solving a problem with no business model, you're, you're going to be rapidly out, but at least you're solving a problem. So, there were companies where, for example, there was a company called Cosmo. Um, and Cosmo was a business where they would deliver things to you in New York or any city. And you could, want, you could wake up at 2 AM and you want a, um, a candy bar, an ice cream, two pound ice cream at the corner store, $2 ice cream. And they'll go deliver it for you and charge you like next to nothing. OK? This was wildly popular. I mean, so you could say, gee, this solves the problem of people don't want to leave their apartment, people want to get their food. You know, we did customer satisfaction surveys and people, 100%, who would, who would say, I don't like this? I wouldn't use this service. They couldn't make any money. They just couldn't make any money because people would not pay enough to support what the service would do. And for a while, when you know, the economy's booming and things are crazy, they figure, well, I don't really need to figure out how to make money. I'm just going to have enough people show up. And at some point, by magic or osmosis, we'll just, this is wonderful. And in fact, you're actually losing money every time someone calls you up at Cosmo and decides they, you know, the cha-ching, it's going in the opposite direction. So you know, this was true of a lot of different businesses like that. So you really have to have a, a business model. You have to make sure you're not only solving a problem for the customer, but they will pay you and, and, and uh, you will make money 
from solving this problem, which means you have to have customers who are willing to pay and willing to pay enough to make this worthwhile. To relate that, again, back to the ticketing example, um, we make 25% worth of fees, which is you know, a pretty good model with no inventory and whatnot. Now, the reason why, because we always get this question, gee, 25%, that seems crazy, that seems too much, that can't be sustainable. And yet, StubHub's grown, Viagogo's grown exponentially, people pay it. Why? Because what we are competing against is people before you had Viagogo, would, I would have a ticket for, uh, uh, I would take my ticket I want to sell. I would sell it to the tout for 100 pounds. He would turn around and sell it to someone else for 200 pounds. So the implicit margin is, you know, markup is triple digits. And it's a very unpleasant process. So the, you are providing real value and solving a real problem for the consumer. They will pay the fees. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. Plus the market, the key thing for people here is safety and security. Not simply getting the best deal. There is no good deal if you get a fraudulent ticket or the ticket doesn't arrive, or you get mugged outside uh, dealing with a talent. What they want is safe, secure, guaranteed. That's what it's about. Because if you were willing to just go cheap, you'd go to eBay. Tickets on eBay are cheaper, okay? People would say, you used to get, well, I know a friend, he went to eBay, had no problem with the ticket. You know, it worked for him. Well, I mean, I have a friend who played Russian roulette. Worked for him, he's fine. <laughs> doesn't mean that everyone's gonna wanna do it. So, you know, that is, is the whole point. If you're providing a service to the customer and you understand what that customer wants, um, they'll pay for it. Now, the second piece of this statement is not a product feature. This is another um, trap that people fall into when thinking about customer needs. They'll say, I've got something. It's going to solve a problem. There are people who are interested in it. Now I'm going to start a business around it. So I'll give you an example from our market. Um, there's something called what we call ticket futures. And there was a company called um, Ticket, uh, Ticket Reserve, and they've been around for a long time, 10 years in the States, trying to flog this concept. And the idea was that you would, um, let's say that uh, Man U, to use a, an example here, you would, at the beginning of the year, you'd put down 20 pounds, and if Man U makes the Champions League final, you would get a ticket at face value. You'd then pay for the ticket. If Man U doesn't make the finals, you lose your 20 pounds. Okay? Now, without getting too much into how this business and business model works, that's not a bad proposition. A lot of people would say, problem is, can customers want to reserve a spot, can't get access to tickets, put down the 20 pounds, sort of sounds like betting. Doesn't sound crazy, sounds interesting. You probably could survey some consumers and they'd say, okay, this is, is great. Um, the problem is, that's really a product feature for a broad ticketing platform like a Viagogo or for a betting company like a Betfair. That's not an entire company built around that. So when you're looking at actually starting a business as an entrepreneur, you've got to have something which has a sustainable business model as a standalone company, unless it's simply a product feature. That also works for a lot of technologies where people would come up with things that, that we've seen where it's simply, it's an interesting feature. It might be an application, for example, on Facebook. There's tons of these, you know, companies that can, applications on Facebook. Some of which are great, some of which are not so great. But there are some people who've confused having an interesting application with starting a business. Now, there may be some applications that are businesses and some uh, that are actually providing the underpinning for the applications that are businesses. But simply having an interesting, cool application um, does not make it a business, even if the product feature works. You're probably better off trying to sell that product feature, actually, to an existing platform or business, rather than thinking you're going to have enough of a standalone business there. The last thing uh, to just touch on before taking questions, so the co constant customer feedback loop. So again, this goes back to when you're talking about your business model, your features, et cetera. Um, you know, once you're starting a business and you're doing this, it's no longer an academic exercise. You're actually trying to sell things to people, and the ultimate arbiter is the marketplace. Either people are buying or they're not buying. You know, and if they're not buying, um, and the customer is not buying. It doesn't matter if you think the customer's stupid or they don't get it or you're ahead of your time or whatever. You need to serve their needs. Um, and so in order to continue to improve, you need to get constant customer feedback. So it could be on the business model. So I'll give you an example of that. Our end customer is the fan who buys and sells the tickets. But one of our partner customers, in a sense, or one of the people in the chain we work with are teams. And we would go to StubHub and we'd make these partnerships, marketing partnerships. They'd get the service. They'd often either pay for the service or market the service. 
And what we figured out is that originally we thought, okay, we'll go into this customer and we will work as a, as a vendor, effectively, a ticketing services company and say, pay us and we'll provide this service. Um, that wasn't gaining as much traction. So we started thinking and we started understanding how they thought about it and the way their organizations thought about it. And we found that if we went to the sponsorship department and we said, we'll be an official sponsor, like your official beer or your official car or your official travel company, that this then would, they would provide the service. We'd actually make a payment and look at it as marketing to the end customers who are the, the fans and all of those people. And it would much more align everything with what that person in the chain wanted to do. So when you're pitching to those partners, we want them to sign up with, a, with StubHub at the time. You had to sort of get the feedback, okay, this isn't working, why not, what do these people want to do, and then make an adjustment. Um, it's the same thing with features and whatnot. It's very easy um, to sort of sit in the room and you can just have, you know, yourself and three other people and say, we think this is great because we did a poll among the four of us and we think it's great. And, it must be great because we're always right. Um, and you know, that's one way to do it, but obviously that's probably not going to be as productive as trying to get feedback from your customers, directly surveying them, trying to speak to people, listen in, looking at the complaints, which is a great piece of customer feedback, customer service. What are people complaining about? What issues are they having? What problems can we solve for them in the feature set? And so again, you can't, you can't take a poll on everything and you're not going to have perfect information to make each of these micro decisions, but um, the more you can actually be aware that you need to be servicing your customers and listening and incorporating what they have to say, the better off you'll be, rather than just sort of being in your own cocoon. So, you know, that's really in terms of just some prepared thoughts on, on you know, understanding customer needs, thinking about, you know, again, it's who is your customer, who are you targeting, what's the problem, can you solve that problem in a way that you can have a business model that will make money and will sustain a standalone business. And then once you do that, have this customer feedback loop to keep improving.